Hello, everyone. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the global health, one of the most important issues that actually we witness every day. And uh, uh, we're going to focus on the developments in this field, how it relates political science and uh, social sciences, uh, and what are the recent developments in this field, and what to be as a political students, as a political analyst, sh should do uh, to work in this field. So uh, global health is indeed the, the most impressive, the most broad and uh, uh, the most urgent topics because what can be most important that in our life, the novel health. And we will touch specifically this, this, these questions, but before we started and uh, before we see the global health mainly in the, in the sciences, because you know it's, it's, it's rather broad uh, in terms of the medicine and uh, public administration and other related fields, but we will, we will focus on the political science and uh, economy and uh, some of the social sciences uh, departments. Uh, but before we start, so let us see a little uh, video presentation of uh, Angel Brack that is very famous in Bangladesh and all over the world uh, that actually was created to solve different problems and uh, um, specifically health problems and the health issues uh, that occurred in Bangladesh. In 1970, a monstrous cyclone devastated what was then East Pakistan. Half a million perished. Millions were destitute. Within months, a savage civil war erupted as the region fought for independence. In 1971, the nation of Bangladesh was born, but it was in shambles. I went into an area which was extremely devastated. There was a lot of houses destroyed. Livestock was decimated, the farmers didn't have any plows. And that suddenly brought to me extreme vulnerability of people in situations like this. And that's how Brack was born. Abed was an executive with Shell Oil, but he quit his job and recruited two dozen young volunteers. They built houses rehabilitated farmland. They established health clinics. In time, Brack's mission shifted from disaster relief to long-term development. Then, Abed decided that Brack should think big. In 1979, it was the International Year of the Child, and we thought, what could we do to bring down child mortality in our country? Nothing claimed more young lives than diarrhea, caused by waterborne diseases like cholera. Diarrhea kills through dehydration. The standard treatment with intravenous fluids was no option in communities with no health facilities. Ironically, researchers in Bangladesh had recently shown that dehydration could also be treated orally, with water mixed with salt and sugar. The added ingredients allow the body to absorb and replace lost fluids. Oral rehydration therapy was a monumental breakthrough. Mothers could now save their children with simple household supplies. They just didn't know it yet. The discovery was there, but it was not disseminated. Most people didn't know how to prepare oral rehydration solution and how to administer it. So we decided basically to go from house to house and teach one woman in every household how to make oral dehydration fluid at home. Brack trained an army of instructors. Teaching the formula took minutes. Half a liter of water, one pinch of salt, and a fistful of sugar. Teaching 13 million women took about 10 years. But child mortality rates were cut in half. So I will stop here, and uh, if you would like, there is a link you, you can later in the presentation where you can see the old video. And uh, actually, I uh, do encourage you to see the story of Bragg because it's, uh, it's it's really interesting to see how the organization NGO can uh, can act in different uh, 
activities and uh, actually can solve real problems that are really too costly for for the government so uh, but nevertheless let's let's take this case and let's discuss a little bit this case so uh, what we have we have uh, actually the uh, one of the greatest cyclones that indeed happened in 70s and cr crushed uh, the economy of very low developed countries that had no economy uh, at that time and uh, uh, we also had the um, actually the, the war inside of the country so you can you can imagine that uh, the country was simply uh, simply crushed and one of the issues was actually child mortality that was pretty high and uh, this specific organization was uh, taking part in uh, um, in solving of this issue that uh, solution was uh, was pretty effective it was not so uh, uh, difficult to do so the only thing that that should be done is actually engagement uh, but what is happening the next is is really impressive because it's actually show how uh, the public health uh, is influencing the development of the country so uh, yeah, so please look here on on the um, on the data presented uh, presented here, and you can see how the uh, child mortality uh, in the connection, the correlation with GDP per capita, uh, was moving through uh, in the Bangladesh. So, uh, so you can see that, uh, for example, in the seventies. Yeah, the child mortality rate was was pretty high, so it was almost 30 uh, 30 percent, and definitely GDP per capita uh, was not uh, was not so high. And later, uh, after the different actions, not only of the Brock NGO but also from the government and to many extent from the international organizations, uh, the situation becoming uh, better and better. So uh, you can see that at the beginning of the 90s, it was something between like 15 or 16 percent. Uh, then in 2000s, uh, it was uh, almost 8 percent. And now the child mortality rate is uh, near 4% and the JDP per capita uh, was, developed, uh, was developed a lot. Uh, so um, indeed, you, you can see how, how these um, things actually correlate, how, uh, how this data correlate. And uh, later, you can see that it also influenced the, uh, the development, say, in the Bangladesh. So just pay attention on the GDP growth. Uh, if people live longer, if the life expectancy is, is longer, so that, that means they simply can act more productively in terms of the um, of making some some goods and uh, developments of the GDP. So you can see how in billions of dollars in general the GDP was uh, was improved. And uh, um, what is interesting that uh, the number of uh, cyclones didn't disappear. So even uh, you can see that it uh, becoming bigger and bigger since uh, since 90s. So it's it's not uh, just Bangladesh. This is uh, overall in the Asian region. Um, and uh, what is more important that the population it's, uh, itself was not growing. Actually, it was uh, th this growth was declining. So they had have the positive growth, but it's not so high. You can see you said uh, that the highest rates of population growth were probably in the end of the 60s, uh, while now it's um, almost like one or two percent of growth. Uh, and uh, the GDP of uh, per capita, uh, nevertheless, is growing. And this is could be described through the situation when the uh, public health in Bangladesh was improved. Not only that case of di uh, diarrhea, but uh, with the other diseases and health. So the situation improved and the country economy and the development of the country is, is going high and high. And today Bangladesh is probably well known as one of the most uh, biggest um, outsourcing markets, IT outsourcing markets in the world. So it's, it's even more developed in terms of the outsourcing in the IT sector than, uh, than for example, Ukraine. Um, so 
th this connection, this correlation do exist. And uh, uh, th that is why it's, it's, it's very, very visible. And uh, a number of researchers uh, were done in this field. And uh, in 2000, the World Health Organization Commission of Macroeconomics co uh, concluded that imp uh, improvements in health indeed accelerates economic development in the country. And like education, health is the, one of the key requirements for the social economic development. Um, and the same words, uh, um, actually, uh, Mrs. Clinton, when she, became, when she was the Secretary of State, uh, her foreign policy was also connected with the health issues. Uh, and uh, once she was asked, what exactly does uh, maternal health or immunization or vaccination or fight against AIDS uh, with the foreign policy, these political issues, and she said, yes, everything. So everything uh, connected with health is a matter of, uh, of the policy making. Uh, so you can see here on this chart actually the uh, the pandemics that we have the joy in brackets to enjoy right now. Uh, and here the um, coronavirus COVID-19 is, is here. So this is a map showing like the deaths uh, that, that happened after the global pandemies. And you can see right now, so uh, the, the visualization is pretty old because now we have almost 800,000 of deaths at the beginning of the um, 2019. And this is quite impressive because uh, COVID-19 uh, um, actually uh, changed the study of, um, of health, of global health, of public health and the political science. And uh, to my mind, to the better. So despite health, um, obvious political and policy normative importance, political science, unlike the majority of the social sciences, uh, does not have a well-established uh, subfield dedicated to the, to the study of health. So uh, political science research uh, in health policy has, um, until probably recently, very been limited to the study of the uh, different policies, uh, different provisions concerning the Medicare and probably comparative studies of different uh, countries. And also to the research of the, um, some of the global agreements uh, that uh, the different countries and in different fields uh, conducted to control the issue of the, of the health care. But actually the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, showed that uh, this is something bigger than only uh, research of the uh, of the governments of of the public interactions or uh, of the uh, public deeds, yes, because we we can see that a number of questions like access to the medical care, um, as for example, distribution of power that cause the conclusions, this or that conclusions of the, um, of the public development in terms of health are much more serious. So it also showed the iniquity in the many societies in, in terms of the uh, access or in terms of the healthy-like expectancy that should be studied. And uh, to my personal mind, I think that among uh, the um, social developments or for example, or economic development, we also need to include uh, health issues into the one of the factors of, uh, of the policies on, in, in, the, uh, in the general scale. So uh, there is a lot of things to do in this, uh, in this field and uh, there is a lot of space to do and how to study uh, the issues connected with the uh, political actions, uh, political participations in different levels, but also how it reflects uh, our health, how it becoming better and healthier during to this um, to, during to this politics, because you can see that the 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 recent effects. When something goes wrong, people are simply dying. And uh, if the critical infrastructure of the country is not prepared, you can see such cases of, uh, of the deaths. Uh, 
uh, that in some terms, especially in, in terms of AIDS, are not, uh, are not finished uh, yet. So what is global health in theory in general? So we can describe global health as uh, at the function of various global diseases and their prevalence in the world and different threats uh, that actually decrease of life or of expectations of the healthy life in the present day. So global health is definitely about the worldwide uh, health improvements, um, improving mental health uh, that are becoming more and more important recently. Also the reduction of uh, the disparities and also the protection against harmful global stress because not only diseases, but actually um, conflict situations uh, like the environmental disasters can also harm, can also kill. So this is also included into the uh, recent understanding of, of the global health. Uh, so how can we measure global um, health? Actually, um, there are different ways. So the first thing is uh, the type of threat, yes. And here, we usually differentiate the communic uh, communicable uh, diseases uh, that are diseases that could be transmitted from one person to another or for example from animal to, to human and here we can name you know actually flu or influenza, uh, the hepatitis um, or, or for example a, any of the respiratory disease that, that we know. Not COVID-19 so viruses and bacteria are also like a part of this story but also non-communicable diseases and CDs, sometimes people talk about that, and this is uh, that kind of diseases that are not transmitted. So they are, for example, um, those types of diseases that, um, that happen, they create in the human bodies, like, like for example, cancer, or uh, like, for example, Alzheimer uh, disease, um, heart diseases, um, different, for example, Parkinson disease, yes, and, uh, uh, um, and other kinds of diseases. And injuries, injuries as a result of some, uh, of some actions that could kill or can do harm. And, uh, but also be uh, usually, um, well, studying in these cases uh, of the um, global health and public health and the global perspective, we use different comparable data that could show this or that uh, reflection is, that is happening in the country. So, and here we talk about the burden of disease. Uh, we also uh, talk about the spread of disease, uh, both in terms of the area and in terms of the sp speed uh, of uh, sharing of the disease and uh, deaths. And here you, you probably see all the maps. So here, this is the, the, the map uh, that is showing the, the COVID-19 uh, spread. Probably some of you from day to day are checking this, uh, these maps. Uh, but also, uh, most recently, uh, we, are, we are paying attention not only to the very subjective uh, factors, uh, like number of deaths or the number of spread of disease, uh, but also to the very socio-economical factors, like, for example, disability-adjusted li uh, life year, that is daily. This is a measure of overall disease burden expressed as a number of years lost due to uh, illness, disability, or even death. So this is simply how many years are stolen from you, uh, or for, for example, in, uh, from the citizens of the country because of some uh, disability or uh, disease or pandemic or conflict or whatever. And, uh, uh, it started to be very popular since uh, 80s, and now it's used as a very broad uh, measurement in any research in this field. Uh, more and more popular become uh, so-called quality, that is quality adjusted life year. Uh, and this is a measurement of the disease burden, including the quality and the quantity of the life uh, lived. So uh, it's typically worked uh, that uh, in a very economic uh, field because um, you can calculate uh, what is the price of, of, of the life like in terms of the intervention of, for example, of state healthcare system and how does it cost, how, how much does it cost. And uh, usually we understand that the quality is, um, um, is number one when you have the perfect health 
and uh, when something is happening, how much does it cost and how much does it take to return you back to this perfect health? And is it possible at all? And here there's a system of judgment for uh, policy making, so you can evaluate whatever, every decision um, in terms of uh, the uh, quality metrics. So this is not used often in terms of the global politics, but very often in terms of the uh, of the public health in specific country, or for example, if uh, if you happen to have some relation to the um, uh, to some projects in the field of health, so this is also a very good dimension to to see how how the improvements uh, can can both help in terms of the quality of life and uh, quantity of life, and what is the price of of this decision. So. Uh, there are mainly two main approaches to the global health, to understanding the, the global health and answering the question, are we becoming more healthier from year to year? So the first um, idea is a global health transition that is generally showing how the uh, situation in, uh, um, in one dimension is changing. So for example, if you, if, if you take the idea of uh, the mortalities from tuberculosis, you, you, you can like simply compare all the years and see how the situation improved, for example, in terms of deaths or in terms of burden of uh, diseases. You can also use daily to see how many potential hours or years were stolen from the uh, society due to tuberculosis. Uh, but it's very important here to understand uh, that different metrics will show you different facts as usual. And uh, for example, mortality or daily will make two big differences. So uh, it's better always to compare different kinds of, uh, of metrics. Uh, the other type is uh, epidemiological transition that actually was, um, was proposed by Omran in uh, 1971. And uh, it describes the change in pattern of uh, cause of deaths that result from social demographic development. So it's showing that the tendency that some kind of diseases or for example, or injuries uh, can go down and instead the, the others can, can become more, more and more popular. So it's showing that kind of change. And uh, using this theory, uh, you actually, your main idea is to analyze so why this or that type of disease is becoming more and more popular in, in that country. So uh, what was done badly so to let this disease to occur? And actually, according to this theory, the global tendency that we can observe right now uh, is the major shift uh, from communicable to non-communicable diseases. So, so uh, we are doing much more better in terms of communicable diseases, but unfortunately, especially in the develop, developed countries, more NCD cases uh, all over the, uh, the world. And you probably know the, the disease right now um, that I haven't heard until the, the, the last few years, like uh, the Alzheimer, for example, disease. And uh, indeed, the statistic, the data shows that uh, NCDs are rapidly increasing globally, but uh, for sure they increase more and more in the developed countries. Well, for example, communicable diseases are uh, more popular in the developing countries or, for example, low-income countries. Uh, so the major question of global health, are we becoming healthier? So let's take our uh, understanding of the metrics that we can use and the approaches to that field and see how they work. Uh, if you take life expectancy, yes, we can see that uh, overall, yeah, the life expectancy is, is going higher and higher. So uh, you can see that uh, the, the life expectancy in the world changed, uh, actually doubled to even to some extent tripled. Yes, um, if, if you compare like 19th century and what we have uh, now, so you can see a world in this green uh, field. Uh, so, Mostly well-developed countries are doing much more better, even coming to the 80 years. In some countries like Japan, I didn't put it here, but in Japan you have the uh, over-aged 
people. Uh, so the uh, the health industry is working and the wealth industry is working pretty good in that. And but you can also see the developing countries that like Ethiopia or other countries that are still um, striving to to reach the. Uh, to reach the top. And you can see, for example, in Ukraine that we are doing right now pretty the same as uh, the world is doing, not so good as Europe, or for example, United Kingdom or, or uh, United States. And here you can also see in the 90th, in the middle of the 40s, there was tremendous drop. So do you guess why this drop was? So then that has answered, answered this question in the forum or during the class. Uh, so, in general, the situation is improving, but definitely it's not uh, uh, linear in, uh, in all the countries, so we can see that every country has its story, and uh, here, for example, while in the 1800s, the, uh, the, most, the most problematic in terms of the life expectancy at birth were like India or Bhutan, uh, here and the mostly developed uh, were, for example, Belgium, U USA, or Netherlands, or Germany, but the level was pretty the same. So you can see that nowadays there is uh, the big difference between the developed countries, uh, like Japan, uh, Australia, and Spain, that are doing more than, than 80 years, and for example, Sierra Leone, uh, Mozambique, or Nicaragua. Uh, that are doing like the expectancy uh, around uh, about 50 years. And you can see also the shift, for example, of different countries, how the situation will change. For example, uh, here India was the worst. Uh, here the situation was pretty good. But here in the 2012 and later, you will see that India is doing better and uh, uh, is doing better and better. Or for example, if you take Russia, that is an interesting case. So it was uh, like in the middle of the 19th century, then uh, the situation improved if you take USSR like in general. But here, Russia returned to the to the middle comparing to the other other countries. So in general, we can evaluate uh, that the life expect uh, expectancy at birth rates in Russia, for example, they, they decrease comparing with the USSR uh, period. So in different countries, they are moving in uh, in different way. That is very natural. But in uh, but globally, yes, if you take the life expectancy at birth, you, you can see that even through the 90s, the situation is becoming more and more better. But here, what is important uh, also to take to account like the healthy life expectancy, not just life expectancy, but the healthy life expectancy that is a little bit uh, lower, but nevertheless, it's also improving. So overall, with the life expectancy, we are doing uh, better. Uh, child mortality is also one of the important uh, features that show us how the countries are developed. So overall you can see that judging by the um, by the UN uh, data uh, in 2016 at least, uh, so we are improving greatly in terms of the child mortality because at uh, the uh, 19th century and previously this was one of the main factors of the decrease of the pop, uh, of the population, natural decrease of population, uh, but nevertheless, you can also see that in some countries of Africa, um, the situation is not so good. And I'm wondering here why Moldova has the rate uh, from five percent to ten percent. So it will be quite interesting to see. And also, some Balkan countries have has uh, the same uh, the same troubles. But overall, uh, the child mortality rates are really uh, low and the situation indeed is uh, improving. Uh, here is a chart that since 90s, it, almost in 20 years, we, we see the big difference. Uh, but upper middle income, high income countries, you can see that they're doing a pretty good job. Well, for example, for the low income countries, they still, the mortality rate is pretty high. However, comparing with the difference of the speed of, uh, of the decrease is, is, is really impressive. Uh, what are the causes of the deaths? If we see uh, of the child mortality, uh, in the majority of cases, you can see that these are uh, the respiratory uh, infections and uh, neonatal 
So the main reason is uh, one of the main reasons is uh, uh, neonatal complications, but uh, also some of the traumas and malaria. So you, you can see that uh, these specific reasons over the world. Uh, this is what we should what the health systems should, should improve here. And especially this kind of neonatal complications that, that actually depends on simply on the infrastructure, medical infrastructure and education of the personnel, uh, of the doctors and nurses who can simply help to and do this job. Nevertheless, in the global scale, you see that this is the second um, most, um, um, pardon, most popular case in terms uh, of the um, child uh, child deaths. Uh, in general, in general, if you are interested, what is happening in the world? You can see that um, actually we have the cases of the cardiovascular diseases, so the heart diseases that are the top reason. And this is a top reason for the last, I think, seven years or even up to 10 years that are happening in the world. So annually, at least uh, in 2017, you can see that 18 million of people are simply killed um, because, uh, are dead because of the heart diseases. Then, then goes cancer, then goes respiratory diseases, and the issues that we usually see in uh, the TV or reading in the newspapers, like terrorism or conflicts. So could you find terrorism here? Yeah, it's, it's here. So you can compare the number of the diseases that we can't actually um, benefit right now. And even comparing uh, like the news with COVID, that indeed is in some of this group, if, if it's not, yeah, if, uh, so in, in terms of the respiratory diseases, so the number of deaths comparing to the simply heart attacks, so it, it can't be compared. So we see that the heart attacks are the most dangerous um, disease globally. And uh, if we take the, uh, actually the death rate and uh, um, of the diarrhea, uh, take into account this, uh, situation in Bangladesh, the, the case that we started, you can see actually that uh, we are doing pretty good um, overall in the uh, in the world. However, yeah, we have the African states and Asia states, and the mortality rate is is pretty high. So it showed that the um, we have this global inequality in terms of solving this problem. So. Uh, there are a number of different statistics. Uh, for example, if you if you use this web website of world in data, uh, you can see different data. Or, for example, if you use the World Health Organization, uh, every major disease has its data, and you can see how the situation was changing. I just want to hear only to to show that despite uh, the uh, many years, look, more than 50 years from 70s past. Nevertheless, this still is an issue in some of the African and Asian states. And it's deeply connected with, uh, with fresh water and with the good water that people can, uh, can drink. Um, so what if we take the burden of disease, you remember, uh, and take the dailies. Uh, so uh, you remember the daily is the number of years let's say that are stolen uh, from people by by some of the disease so if, if you compare and if you take all the disease you can see that in general um situation overall is not so happy because uh the life expectancy indeed is growing however due to different diseases due to different reasons uh people can't live as the uh, they are expected to live and here you can see that out of the 100,000 of individuals if you take uh there are some countries once more in africa in um, in asia when uh, the uh, the mortality rate is pretty high, so the people simply can't can can leave uh, this expected uh, time. And here in Ukraine, yes. So the uh, take into account this daily, uh, so the the years stolen, you can see that at least 
uh, one third, uh, so thirty percent almost uh, of the uh, of the health troubles that that are happening. They are not letting people to live healthier or even to live uh, as it was expected. So thirty percent is, is is pretty high number, but not so high as comparing to the uh, to the African state. And here is a good chance also to see by the groups, yes, of the uh, social groups, by the economic groups of low uh, income groups or high income groups or medium income groups, what a situation is happening here. Um, let, let us do it a little bit. So if you take the burden of disease, you can see once more that the number is decreased. Uh, in the world, Ukraine is doing um, pretty the same as uh, the world is doing, a little bit higher in uh, 2017. But well, for example, developed countries are doing uh, not so bad. So the, let's say 20,000 uh, 20, of people out of 100,000 of people, uh, it's still pretty high, but not so high uh, comparing, for example, with Ethiopia or developing countries. And so here also the issue of the uh, inequality, let's say, in terms of health is playing a lot. Uh, yeah, but uh, how, how many, so what is the influence of the burden of uh, disease? You, you can see here, um, actually this is a number of, total number of years that uh, that are stolen of the healthy years that are stolen by diseases different kinds of diseases and here you can see once more we had the most spread in terms of the deaths um, diseases uh, i mean cardiovascular disease or heart diseases cancer and neonatal disorders and the same story here these diseases are, are stealing from us uh, globally the uh, the major number of uh, of years well once more conflict and ter terrorism 10 million years if we compare uh, if if you compare all the countries or it, not so compare but if you take all the countries uh, and uh, and add them so we will have this number so it's it's still pretty pr pretty huge um, but this is like the general situation but in typically we should we should look inside of the each country and inside of the each group so you can see that uh the total share uh in different countries is um is different one more this is daily so if for example you uh, you take united states you can see that uh heart diseases this is the most uh shared um, and the popular disease in the United States, then cancer, then other disorders. United Kingdom, you see cancer, that is on the first place. But for, uh, for Ethiopia, for example, this is neonatal diseases. The, I was impressed by that, uh, by the way. And uh, here in Syria, you can see the major reason of uh, stealing years from, uh, from the healthy life is conflict and terrorism that is understood because there is a war happening um, happening here. So you, you can compare by these countries, by different groups, and see how the situation with diseases is, is different. So if you take like uh, some of the groups of the uh, low middle, for example, you can see that the, once more, uh, probably NCDs are the most uh, popular here in that group. While, for example, in the high income, the, uh, the situation is pretty the same, yeah, but for example, in the uh, low income countries, um, once more, the neonatal disorders, uh, when, the, when kids are born, so this is dramatically a problem in the low income countries that once more could be very easily solved if you have the good infrastructure and good education for the uh, for doctors. So, but what if you compare uh, these cases um, by countries, by the group of countries uh, globally, you can see that we have here the, the two dimensions actually of the countries, those who have the majority of uh, the commun uh, communicable diseases and uh, the 
um, of, of those who have non-communicable diseases. So you can see here the share of these countries that there is no simple solutions because some of them are developed, some are not. You, you can see number of uh, countries, for example, uh, when they had the majority of the uh, communicable diseases and they are pretty developed in terms of the um, uh, of the income per capita but for example the also the developed countries um, like for example United States or Belgium or Finland or Australia and here also the United Kingdom uh, they have the NCD cases more often than um, that, that, that kills than uh, for example communicable cases and um, can you find Ukraine here? I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah, Ukraine should, should be in this blue zone somewhere here, so it's not written here, but we have almost like 30, around 30, 26, 30,000 of cases per 100,000 of cases uh, per year. So uh, this group distribution is, is rather interesting case, but it could be described because here, <coughs> Pardon, United States are here. Uh, so the infrastructure is so developed that um, uh, that actually the, the, the majority of cases are, uh, that are coming to to kill um, really of the communicable diseases because the others are still in these years by the infrastructure and the medicine is working so good that it's declining a little bit your uh, life expectancy, but else but you can actually leave and live along with, uh, with the uh, non-communicable diseases and have the regular and good treatment. So it's not a problem anyway. So uh, yeah, you, you can see by the major of cases, nevertheless, the um, NCDs are happening more than in the developed countries than they happening uh, the uh, communicable cases. So please compare, for example, Norway and Norway, or for example, United States here and United States here, uh, or for example, Belgium here, here. So all the developed countries have this tendency of having NCD, as we told, more often than, uh, than CDs. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and if, if you look um, by the health expenditures, so uh, to the treatment that is spent for, uh, for this field, you, you can see actually one interesting point here, uh, that uh, usually the states are doing better, so this disease burden is decreasing when you simply invest a lot into the medicine. There is very natural. But you can see here how the situation was, was changed through year to year and pay attention to the Ethiopia, put it here, and Ukraine. So you can see this shift of Ethiopia, you can see the shift of the world, but it seemed that Ukraine simply stuck at the same point when the health expenditures per capita are not growing since the 90s. Uh, major grow, growing, just pay attention here, it's 1,000 and here, 2,000, but nevertheless, we are in still group. And uh, the number of cases is a little bit declining, uh, but for example, comparing with the Ethiopia, it's, uh, yeah, it's not that move. Uh, that is good, it should not be like the, the rapid fall, but nevertheless, uh, you can also see that the developed countries like United Kingdom and the United States are pretty having the same and the United States even a little bit more uh, here in terms of the uh, in terms of the cases. So um, that, that, that's actually showed the, the very simple logic. So if you if you invest, if you spend more uh, for your health, that means that you can improve uh, in general uh, situation. So the, there is a clear, clear correlation between the social economic factors, expenditures and uh, the and, and the health system. Uh, and uh, that is interesting because sometimes we, we fail to understand it and we do have some expectations for the country. We look later, so what, what are the, the real expenditures? But here uh, you can see what, for example, in terms of the United States, what how people think about the problems and how people think about the, uh, the importance of this or that kind of disease. So you can see that actually the causes of death in 2016 in the United States were heart diseases and cancers, while the major Google research were on, on, on cancer, 
Then we have a group on terrorism that was pretty high on suicide. Uh, but the media coverage, uh, like in New York Times, was more about the terrorism and homicide and suicide. The same story with the media coverage in uh, Guardian. You can see on the cancer is a little bit uh, broader group. But actually, heart diseases, uh, the most spread uh, threat is, it was not covered too much and, uh, and people don't think that this is this is actually the one of the most dangerous diseases in in the United States so always you should always pay attention on these factors because it's actually um, showing the very natural scale but even in terms of media and the people considerations uh, this is a matter of the uh, public health education and the public health coverage um, so more and more improvements in this field should be done so people understand the problems uh, correctly. So let's do here the little follow-up. Uh, so in general, if, if you have a question, what is going on? Yes, uh, are we living better? Yes, we are living better. Because life expectancy at birth has increased. Uh, you saw it from 70 years since 90s, and estimated life expectancy in general is uh, 72.5 years in 2015. And the healthy life expectancy in birth, uh, that was 64 uh, in 2015, it's also increased since 90s. So uh, it's also expected in six years increase uh, since, uh, the, uh, since that time. But also we can see that uh, the, there is a gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, and it's increasing. So it's not increasing dramatically, but, but a little. And that simply shows that um, we are not using all the potential that we have. That means that our systems, our uh, health systems are not working um, greatly in terms of the providing uh, like fully the um, the treatment that we can expect like healthy, healthy life. And this is one of the series. There are many assumptions that uh, the healthy life expectancy in the next years, uh, so this gap between healthy life expectancy and life expectancy will be growing and growing. And simply we will live more and more uh, unhealthy. We will live longer, but we will live unhealthy. That, that, that is one of the troubles. So uh, also we are doing great in terms of the burden disease because total daily is fell by the 4% since the 90s, but still this is not the dramatic, uh, the dramatic shift. What is interesting here, uh, Georgian, by all this data, that uh, we can see directly by different countries, uh, and in terms, uh, especially if you, if, if you put the GDP per capita uh, data comparing with the expectancy of daily, uh, you can see that epidemiological patterns are uh, really related to the demographic situation. So health is not just medicine, it's actually the lifestyle of society or the lifestyle of economy. And there is very clear correlations between life expectancy, between income, inequality, education, and uh, many other factors. So in, that's, in that term, uh, public health, or, or in our case, global health, is real socioeconomic. Uh, issue and should be treated as social economic issue and that's mean that it is one of the should be one of the major issues in the political science that try to uh, to work with the social economic issues so you can see that uh, depending on the uh, on the income and depending on the type of your governing uh, there is a huge difference between different countries uh, in terms of deaths, and uh, you can see while the situation is growing a little bit, uh, for example, in high income countries, oh, just in all countries. Nevertheless, uh, the, um, you can see that still the reasons are uh, a pretty, um, pretty predictable. So NCDs are taking more and more. Uh, high income countries can uh, afford themselves to spend more money for the uh, very expensive solutions and it's working in that case while for example for low income uh, countries the majority of different problems they still exist and uh, it's very hard for them to uh, 
to develop in this field. Uh, so we come here once more to the very natural conclusion that um, if you spend more on health, if you treat it as the uh, political issue, as a social economical issue, you have uh, in general the development of the situation and later it brings you back because you have more people power to work, to produce, to, to work properly and to increase like the income of uh, the state, the, the wealth of the state. So here you can directly see that uh, more fewer and fewer children die as more money spent to the public health and uh, probably you, you can't find any country uh, that, uh, the, uh, that we have the um, the other correlation so everybody who is investing into the into the health have lesser cases of the children mortality however you can see the difference how, how different countries have crossed this this field yes and uh, uh, but nevertheless we are we are going going to the to the down that is great uh, and the same uh, story with the life expectancy so if more money are spent for health, that simply means that your life expectancy is increased. So there is direct correlation. You can see how the th situation was uh, was changing. Some of them were doing great, uh, but in the major in the major scale, uh, still a lot of uh, sh sh should be done, especially for the African states that uh, can't afford to spend uh, to spend more and to do this shift. Uh, really dramatical. So once more, this is more not about the medicine, it's actually the system of medicine and this is a system of economy that helps you to, to work in that. Uh, what is also interesting here that talking about the uh, political science, uh, we should be, you see how the, how the different issues, global issues in terms of the water supply or inequality, or for example, even the populism or here the urbanization are really connected with each other. So uh, you can see right now, taking issue by issue, uh, how they create this global scales of, uh, of dependency. And here, I'm talking about uh, the urbanization. This is one of the serious problems because uh, uh, it's, it's happening. We know that it's happening uh, and it's uh, increasing. So uh, right now we are living in the world uh, of, uh, that consists let's say 55% of the urban population, but in a few years, up to the 2050, you'll be living in the world that consists of 70% of the urban population. And this is a tremendous problem for the developing countries, and especially not so rich countries. It simply means that the cities are growing, but the infrastructure is not so growing. So you can see here the, some of the prediction and uh, what is happening in the uh, urbanized world. Uh, so as the um, cities are growing, the um, people from the rural areas come into the cities, so the density of po population is, um, is becoming high and high in these cities, and, and uh, the, uh, the infrastructure problems, the, the problems also with uh, the, uh, let's say, communicable diseases is also increased because more people and the density is, is uh, much more higher. And uh, uh, this is one of the most important, I think, issues in terms of the urban development uh, for, the, for the future, uh, because uh, if people can't afford the good access to the health, that means that everybody will turn down to be in the same uh, situation in the cities. And we know it di directly. So if uh, the uh, city population is, um, can't pay for for health if uh, state properties and city pro uh, city um, government can can't work effectively. We will definitely feel uh, if, even if we were for ages and our families were from this urban population. So you can see comparing in different states, but nevertheless for the um, for the developing countries, it is indeed one of the serious problems. Uh, this means that we should spend more. So the logical outcome, we should spend more. And what is the structure of the health uh, expenditures? I was wondering how, how many we spend uh, each year. So actually you can see that almost 8 trillion of US dollars 
uh, the uh, spending of the humanity annually for our, uh, for our house. You can also compare, for example, with the number of uh, spendings for, uh, for military or for war or in, in the other fields and see what are the results. So uh, the, the majority of spends are actually um, a domestic public expenditures of, uh, of health. So states are more engaged into that. But also the second group is actually the domestic private expenditures of, uh, on health um, that, that, that people are paying from the pocket. And also we have a little group from uh, the expenditures for the external sources. This is usually the help of the uh, international organizations or, uh, or whatever. So not public, nor, nor, nor private. And uh, the structure of that is really uh, different. So you can see uh, different countries here in the middle, how they are spending and what are the flows, what are the lines uh, that are going uh, in terms of the public health. So you can see that actually the, the United uh, States, uh, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada and Australia are the most um, global spenders uh, of, uh, the, um, uh, of costs for uh, for, for helps uh, for health and uh, nevertheless you can also see that uh, comparing to the other governments uh, so other governments are pretty all the other doing a little bit less than uh, the United States but what is interesting also here that we have increase and it is it's a year from year increase in the private philanthropy so more and more private foundations uh, are spending together with the states or, for example, um, like the international organizations are, uh, are spending. Uh, so, and this is good sign. This is good sign. For example, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the most global uh, foundations that spends for in different programs for the public health. But it's interesting also see that you can see that the majority of the costs are going just through, for example, in case of the United States, uh, on their global initiatives. But here, the majority of costs are also going through UN agencies. That means the United Nations is one of the glo uh, most global um, agencies that, uh, that can spend this, uh, this money. But also uh, the NGO and foundations are doing the great job. Yes, so you can see, for example, that annually uh, it's pretty the same in NGO and foundations are doing as uh, UN agencies are doing. And the development banks uh, definitely are spending, are spending a lot. Uh, and the global funds are sp spending a lot that is understandable. So uh, you, you can see that the inputs of uh, both of states are important. The increase of the private philanthropy is important. And actually international organizations are doing the same as the, uh, the countries are uh, spending. And um, different international NGOs or national NGOs that engage into this field uh, are also players in this field. So not only, uh, so the public health issue is not only the issue of the states. You can see that many, many international actors are engaged uh, into the field. And if you judge by money, are doing pretty the same amount of the uh, of the work. Yep. Uh, so uh, how the health expenditures is um, distributed in different types of the economies is one of the interesting uh, cases. So you can see in the low countries, the the majority, at least at the two uh, thousands, was spent by the by the simple people. And, uh, uh, and by donors, while uh, recently there is a little bit increase of payments by governments that um, still face difficulties to do that. In the lower middle countries, you see almost the same if people are spending and uh, the governments are spending. And in terms of the uh, highly developed economies in the high income countries specifically, you can see that this is an obligation of the spend. So governments are the main players uh, in, in this field. And uh, uh, we can see only uh, um, not, not so high, near 20%, uh, if I see correctly, uh, on the high income countries. Uh, so the people are paying from themselves. So uh, both 
like insurance, state insurance, private insurance, but everything that is regulated and going through state is, is taking the, uh, the main place. And this is indeed one of the most important state responsibilities. And uh, yeah, you, you can see here the same situation with, with the number. So it's, it's almost pretty the same, yeah, because health spendings and the percentage of the GDP uh, is almost the same in uh, different countries. So it's like five to eight, uh, percent definitely more are spending the uh, developed countries and they are spending more in terms of percentage from the budget and in in costs so uh, that is why we have all these results with the expectancy and the disease control uh, nevertheless the percentage is is, is pretty the same and uh, yeah and uh, in general in general you can see how uh, what is if you take one uh, one in another country, so once more, mostly well-developed countries are spending more on this issue, and this is important issue in, for their public policy. Uh, while uh, there's no opportunities, usually the developing countries are dependent actually on donors because because if they don't get this money, people will not be able to to pay. We, we see that on the graph, and that could be a tremendous problem because as we see, a number of especially communicable diseases are not controlled by the borders. Um, if we have such COVID cases in one country, that's definitely could be shared all over the world. So that is why it is a global problem and could not be uh, left only in uh, in the one country. Yeah, this is the same, the, uh, the health care expenditures, like uh, the percent of the, of the budget in different countries. So you can see that Ukraine is doing the same as the Central Europe and Baltics. World is doing a little bit better. Um, yeah, lower middle income countries are doing worse, but once more, this is percentage and we should look on the, on the costs, the real costs that, uh, that are spent. Yeah. Um, and this, this are actually the, the, the costs, yes, uh, the, the question of the costs. Uh, sorry for that. So you see in terms of Ukraine, uh, they're pretty <laughs> much that should be done because the public expenditures are not so, um, are not so high, unfortunately. So $500,000 from one person, like in annual. So this is, this, this is not so good. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, once more, the same, the same story, we can see that developed countries can afford more, can get more from, uh, as, as, a, as a case of taxes from people, but can spend more for the, um, uh, for the, health, uh, for the health issues. And uh, unfortunately, Ukraine is like, is, we're doing a little bit better than the low and middle income countries, but uh, we are not even doing the same as the general world, world and we are doing much more worse than Central, Central Europe. So here you can see that the difference once more. This is percentage of the other budget that is good. And this is actually indeed in terms of money. So the question of being rich is a very important question in our in our cases. Uh, so yeah, and let's let's take the final step. Let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and its impact on our societies, the, the real um, and global problem that, that we unfortunately uh, faced. So um, in general, we can see that it's, and we probably know that uh, it is not, uh, it's still in process and we are expecting to have the second wave uh, of this problem. And uh, actually this is a number of uh, cases that uh, is conf confirmed. So the, the recent data that I tried to, to present you and uh, by now we have uh, almost um, 8,600,000 of people that, uh, that are killed because of this uh, disease and this is not non-stop, so the number will increase uh, more and more. What impacts it has besides of the health problem? Definitely it crushed economies because of the lockdown. And you can see directly after the, um, the lockdown was announced in a number of countries that it was a cause of the 
uh, expectation of the country that they will meet some difficulties with the uh, critical infrastructure, um, critical medical infrastructure. You can see that the stock market simply, simply fall and uh, they are not coming to the position that was at the beginning of the year and we will spend more and more years of uh, developing the situation. Uh, the unemployment is also because of uh, the global pandemics, not only because of the uh, lockdown, but it's very natural things of the, the present global pandemics that happened also caused a number of the unemployment issues. So that is why it's always better to prevent such such troubles and you can see it that in general by different countries the percentage is different um, but uh, for example in the number of countries that uh, are dependent uh, on the uh, pardon Uh, um, are dependent on, on, on people uh, in not in the industry sector so um, the the percentage could be really could be really huge this is the first quarter I think but even the United States so this is this is what they predicted till the end of the year um, Canada told 7% in Ukraine, I think it was uh, up to also up to 7% uh, prediction. Yeah, so uh, the uh, unemployment rate is, is, uh, is one of the problems because uh, simply that means that you should do something with that. And we know that in some of the states, both for example, Canada, United States, they started spending money uh, they started programs simply to help a little bit people. So once more, more expenditures, later more taxes. So that's a very clear situation. Um, and that uh, also means with the unemployment that we are in danger to lose the GDP growth. And uh, in majority of the countries, we will lose this uh, GDP growth. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, this is also the serious problem of the, uh, of the rece recession that can come. Uh, in the majority of cases, um, countries are declaring that they will lose up to 10% of GDP growth. And what we know right now is that in general in the world, uh, we will lose approximately three and a half percent of the GDP growth. Uh, it was uh, declining a little bit, naturally declining a little bit light last year, and there were many predictions of the economists that it will that it will decline a little, especially in the developing countries. But here we can see that definitely this is. is this is not the health crisis, this is economical crisis. So it's both health and economical crisis that is happening in the year. And uh, it's also influenced a number of uh, the um, of this uh, sectors of the economy and definitely international tourism is was one of the uh, major infected. We all know that. And you can see how, uh, how the number of tourists decrease. So actually in the world around 44% of the uh, of the tourists were decreased and it's a tremendous uh, effects for the to tourist sector uh, at all and uh, now we also see that the different countries uh, were reacting differently so some of them despite the uh, increase of the danger of uh, of covid uh, nevertheless were pretty open with their borders some of them as in ukraine so we closed borders several times and uh, for the international uh, for the international visitors and it's also harmed the hospitality for example uh, sector and uh, the total flights yeah very logically if the people there is no need for them to fly uh, and uh, if there is a danger to fly they fly less so you can also see how naturally number of flights was pretty the same uh, in different years even in 2019 the level was increased but not in 2020 so the number of daily flights decreased uh, tremendously and uh, we don't know when it uh, will be uh, when we will return to the previous uh, data and uh, it's directly influenced, for example, oil prices. So everything is connected. It's influenced oil prices. And you can see the tremendous fall of the uh, oil prices in US. And now we can see a little bit situation is becoming uh, better for this price because uh, once more this travel, um, 
uh, travels started to be more active, but we don't know what, what will be happening in the, in the next few years. And uh, um, what is also interesting here that despite this is uh, um, economic trouble, nevertheless, uh, there are also sectors that, that win and uh, pharmacies are doing a good job. So you can see how, uh, for example, this uh, two companies, according to Bloomberg, uh, so are starting um, a boom, actually. So if you happen to invest before the corona crisis uh, into pharmacy sector, you have done a good job. <laughs> so, uh, and, and indeed, uh, uh, this is not because they are bad. Yes, we know that uh, everybody is trying to be engaged in that field and uh, vaccine is really important. So there is natural growth in this, uh, in this field so that we should take into the consideration. Uh, so uh, what is, how much does it cost in terms of money? Uh, we can see uh, by the presentation of uh, OECD that uh, unfortunately uh, it takes at least two years to come back uh, to the normal that we, that we had. And especially in terms of we will have this double uh, second wave or double hit scenario, uh, we'll spend more time. So uh, it's hard to predict, but um, according to the many estimations uh, right now, since the beginning of the year, we lose approximately 10 trillion of US, uh, US dollars um, yeah, we will lose uh, at the, by the end of the, uh, of the year. And uh, so the recent developments a little bit are included there. So this is actually the price by the end of the year that we will, for the global economy that we will have from, uh, from COVID. And that simply means that <laughs> this money could be invested some, somewhere else. So, but it also uh, influences not only the economy, but many of the social reasons, uh, not only the health reasons, but for example, uh, European Union Institute for Security Studies presented a nice research, and I just want to show you here that it also influenced uh, some of the, um, for example, of the armed uh, groups and uh, arms, uh, armed group conflicts, sorry for that, uh, that started using this situation for, uh, for their reasons, for political reasons. And uh, you, you can also, uh, we can also see a number of clashes between the states and uh, between um, the civilian groups um, in the United States, in Canada, also in Europe. Uh, and the main reason of them were um, like the social issues, but actually the COVID situation and uh, the uh, employability rates that they, they also helped the radical groups to, to improve their situation and uh, uh, to, uh, to use that COVID issues as one of the factors like in their protests. So um, Radicalization of the um, of the agenda is also part of the story, besides only of the economical issues. So, uh, what was done in general in the world uh, concerning the global health? Definitely, besides the expenditures that increased and the situation that uh, in every country are trying to, to solve these difficulties, and to, despite the international foundations and the private foundations and donors who are spending more and more, uh, so there are a number of different uh, global initiatives, and I will concentrate very quickly on a few of them uh, that mostly regulate the overall global level of the health. While once more, there are a number of them that are regulating con uh, concrete diseases uh, of fields. And uh, we know that the major organization is the World Health, uh, Health Organization that are doing both statistics, uh, providing some uh, influence uh, in terms of the regulations in this field and, uh, and working closely with a number of states, identifying uh, the cases and what could be done. Uh, but here I will state all, once more on the most global issues of the old field. And here I should mention the declaration of the Almata, very old declaration that was uh, mainly signed uh, to control the primarily health care. That was indeed a trouble in that field. And it was the first global attempt to, uh, to take a motto that 
health should be um, established for everyone. So sometime uh, this type of motto and uh, they were trying this uh, declaration that signed all the countries in the world like to to build the system of the equal access uh, to health systems and if the states failed these declarations were also including some of the uh, international uh, involvements of uh, the um, private donors and international companies that could also build and invest to, to give everybody the equal access to the system. Uh, what is important that this, this declaration proclaimed health as not only medical issue, but also social economic issue and security issue and human right issue. Everybody and put the state responsibility for ensuring the necessary level of the uh, health and uh, um, public health and uh, equal access to the public health. And it's also uh, proclaimed the support, the overall support to the developing countries of reaching this, um, these indicators, because in declaration, the number of indicators uh, were reached. So, uh, and it worked perfectly for the number of years. Nevertheless, uh, it was very criticized sometimes for not being specific in the fields, but let's take into account that it was pretty, uh, pretty old. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, uh, the, the other major declarations of an agreement was international health regulations, and uh, they provided rights and obligations in handling public health events and uh, emergencies that have the potential to cross the border. So it was more oriented on the communications between the state and uh, the diagnosis of the overall situations not to cause such pandemies as, as we cause. So annually, they, they made uh, within this uh, declaration, uh, they made uh, um, a number of uh, the objectives that countries should meet. And uh, the major issue here is actually the, the uh, sharing of uh, information. Uh, then the declaration of Astana, sorry, wrong, um, date it was actually signed uh, in 2018 so two years ago and uh, uh, this declaration of astana should change the declaration of Mal alma ate actually creating the concrete data and concrete numbers that states should take to to ensure the um, the working and uh, uh, health system in the countries uh, in every country despite of the income uh, type and currently um, the uh, countries are working on the framework convention of global health this should be the the largest overall framework uh, that unites all the countries in the world and uh, that will be engaged into the field of the um, global health and uh, um, i don't know what what will be the when it will be prepared but uh, the uh, it was one of the ideas of the uh, elected in 2017, I think, uh, the, uh, the head of the um, World Health Organization, but it was, it was not done uh, yet. So this framework is still, so it's operating as a framework, uh, but uh, there is no huge convention. It, it should be done in the, in the next years. And definitely the sustainable development goals. Uh, sustainable development goals uh, that were created in 2015 and set very clear agenda until the 2030. So they, they have very clear targets. You can see some of them uh, in different fields uh, of the health care and actually the, um, the goal number three uh, is stating like that we should uh, establish the good health and well-being for the all. Uh, citizens until the 2030 and uh, the system is working uh, as you know that every country that uh, joined the SDG and every country joined the SDG they have their national priorities and they have a national understanding of targets uh, what should be done in this or that situation uh, taking into account like very shortly about for example Ukraine that we are doing in this field we are doing not so bad but uh, there are a number of the issues that uh, should be taken seriously and overall the improvements in the um, in the healthcare in Ukraine should, should be done but uh, what is great here that uh, once more it's set specific targets 
and everybody in the country just do the localization. That means that you can measure, that means that you can uh, analyze uh, what are the state regulations in this field and, uh, and in terms of the global health, uh, the um, UN agencies or academia can, uh, can also estimate um, how we are improving the, the present situation. Uh, what are the main troubles to the global health? Uh, actually, uh, last year, uh, World Health Organization ma named major modern threats to the global health that should be worked on in, uh, in the global scale. And the first one is the air pollution and the climate change, and that you see the penetrations of these fields. And because annually 7 million people are killed because uh, of the different bacteria and not uh, good uh, air, uh, and this is great number of uh, of uh, actually mortalities, but it's also influenced the uh, the lives of so the health lives of people because uh, in the polluted air, it's uh, there is a danger of cancer and other diseases that uh, that that we may face. Also, rise of non communicable diseases that what we are talking about, and uh, well, the countries are doing. <laughs> not enough, but usually are doing great in terms of the, um, in terms of the, for example, influenza or other pandemies. Nevertheless, this uh, this disease's number is increased, and 70% of all deaths in the world are because of that reason. Respiratory disease pandemics uh, is also an important issue. Definitely not only because of COVID-19, but uh, in other possible cases. Uh, the fragile and vulnerable conditions uh, in different states is also a, tr a trouble because 22% uh, of the global population live in such conditions. And this is a condition that the people can't afford, for example, access to the medicine or they're uh, living in the conflict zones and once more they, they face trouble with that. And uh, that's actually a great challenge because uh, once more, uh, the number of diseases, respiratory, uh, respiratory diseases, communicable diseases are not just staying in the one uh, territory, they are moving always. Um, Antimicrobial resistance, one of the serious problems because uh, in the number of fields, uh, all the um, actually antibiotics or whatever uh, that were created to, uh, to scope with the problems uh, are showing that uh, um, the viruses and bacteria are changing their behavior, so they became more and more resistant. Zeus, there is a danger that a number of uh, the um, cure, the medicines that we used to uh, use for, for curing uh, will not work anymore. And this is a serious problem for the pharmacies uh, to work on the uh, solutions. Then, uh, weak primarily health care. This is an issue in terms of the Astana Declaration in many of the developing countries. And we know that this is the first step in terms of the uh, of the national and then later the uh, global health. And also anti-vaccination, one of the very, very dangerous problem uh, that occurred in the recent years. And uh, actually, actually every year uh, vaccines helps to prevent near two to three million deaths. Uh, but within the spread and the popularity of the anti-vaccinators, um, this is a real danger of, of deaths and uh, of sharing this, this trouble. So um, this means simply that education also in this field is, uh, is what is needed. So uh, let us do the uh, general follow-up. So we can see that global health indeed is very interconnected with a number of different problems. And the main idea of the global health is uh, not just health improvement, but also reduction of the disparities and protection of the harmful global threats. Uh, we can measure it in different uh, types, but usually we use the burden of disease, the spread of disease, um, the speed of spread, the mortality rates, and daily. So the, the number of years that are stolen from the health 
uh, living. Uh, overall, we improve our health globally, but uh, we are moving uh, to the gap between expected rates of living and uh, health, healthy living, and also we are moving to the uh, non communicable diseases uh, more and more that are happening in the countries and that are most serious in terms of treatment. Uh, we definitely should make health issues as a part of the political agenda and the political analysis uh, because we can see right now that uh, especially with the COVID cases that it creates a number of different troubles not only with health but also with the social and economic issues and there is concrete correlations between wealth health and social development so that should be taken as a social and economic problem and uh, one of the follow-ups that we should reduce the uh, global diseases in different countries and especially in the developing countries so the the issue of the global, uh, global donorship and health is, is still a very important issue because borders are not limiting uh, these diseases and uh, this is also the serious term in terms of the uh, communications and collaboration in different countries how we can uh, solve this situation so let's take these chances to see global health as a serious issue as a serious challenge and see what we can do on the national level on the next class.